In this episode, we're going to be talking about the theme of counterintuitiveness. There's a general principle of life, one of my most important principles, which simply states that life is counterintuitive. Life is counterintuitive. Now, that's a very simple principle. And if I just said that to you in a five minute video and you heard that, you would just go about life and you wouldn't understand the depth of what is being said here, because something very powerful and deep is being said here, which is why we need to go through a long list of examples to help illustrate this for you. And I've been alluding to this principle a lot in my work in the past, where I tell you that all, oh, this facet of life is counterintuitive and that facet right there is counterintuitive. And I keep saying that, but we need to really hit it head on. I first became aware of this principle when I learned it from Eben Pagan, who talked about it in the context of being successful in business and also female attraction. And in those two fields, it's, it's, a, it's a quite an important principle, and we'll talk about those two fields. But then what I saw is that I, as I was studying personal development and applying it for the last five years and thinking about it a lot and communicating it to a lot of people. I just kept seeing more and more and more examples of how this principle is found everywhere throughout life. And it was just uh, mind blowing for me. And I, I kept a list, a list of all the examples. And it's a very, very long and juicy list that I want to share with you. So that's mostly what we'll be doing today. Success basically in anything is counterintuitive, whether it's in business, in attraction, in relationships, but also things like with emotions, and with spirituality and um, basically every every facet of life. Uh, you see, the fool, the fool assumes he already knows everything. And he just sort of stumbles his way into some new domain of life. And because he assumes that he knows everything already, and there's really nothing new that would ever surprise him, uh, he always takes the most obvious route, does the most obvious things, and ends up falling into every trap and stumbling onto every landmine. And then, of course, that's why he becomes a failure. And so to really become successful, you have to learn to rethink the most obvious routes that people take in life. Because, of course, most people are not successful. Most people get very mediocre results and they struggle and they hit their head against the wall over and over and over again. And they just don't know. Well, I don't know. Life seems so hard and life seems so troublesome and problematic and full of suffering and full of evil, all these things. And it just see that then they project that out into the external world and they think that life just is that way. No, it only seems that way because you're taking the obvious foolish routes and you're not considering the counterintuitiveness of life. You must really learn to appreciate just how tricky reality is. Reality is a very, very tricky thing. Very, very deceptive. So, the key lesson from this episode is that you always want to be looking for that counterintuitive move that you can make in every important situation in your life, whether it's with business, with your career, with getting hired for a job, with attracting the right person for a relationship, or with your spirituality, or when you're meditating. Always be looking for that counterintuitive move. It's these counterintuitive moves that separate you from the herd. Now, before you give, I give you the whole list of examples, um, let's, uh, let's mention an interesting point here about the word counterintuitive. So I'm using the word in the sort of colloquial sense, but really it's a misnomer. Because actually it might seem like, well, Leo, so, so you got something against intuition? So if I'm following my intuition in life, that somehow means I'm going to live a bad life. I'm going to be a fool. And actually, it's quite the opposite. What I want you is to follow your intuition more. Um, so then why does the word counterintuitive use in this, in this case? Well, really what the word counterintuitive really means, it's more like actually counterlogical. 
what it means is that it's the most logical solutions. Usually those end up being the wrong ones. The intuitive solutions actually require you to already take into account that things aren't going to obviously work out in a straight linear path. So really what we mean when we say counterintuitive is we mean counterlogical. We mean it's the opposite of common sense. We mean that it's the opposite of what you would naively expect going into a situation. We mean that it's uh, there's something misleading and something non-obvious about this facet of reality that needs to be understood in order to achieve success here. We also mean often that it's the emotionally difficult thing to do in many cases. Usually, the counterintuitive thing is emotionally difficult and the the logical or obvious thing, that's the emotionally easy thing that we're sort of wired to do. And also what counterintuitive usually means is that it requires a sort of a cognitive leap in perspective, stepping outside of your existing perspective in order to, to get a good result. So why is this topic of counterintuitive is so important? Well, because wisdom itself is counterintuitive. And one of the things that I love most of all is wisdom. And people who love wisdom are, by definition, philosophers. And that's really what Actualize.org is. It's, it's a modern version of philosophy. And philosophy is not just abstract ideas about stuff. Philosophy is about how to live the good life. It's also the pursuit of truth. How do you structure your life such that you live the best kind of life? That is philosophy, and that requires wisdom. And that is counterintuitive stuff. And so, since most people, what they're looking for life in life is they're looking for a good life, but then they don't take into account the wisdom and the counterintuitive nature of wisdom, then they end up getting the wrong kind of life, and then they suffer, and then they're depressed, and then they, uh, they get all the wrong kind of results, and they can't get success where they want it. What I want to teach you is how to get good at spotting wisdom. And another sort of corollary principle uh, that I want to share with you is that the more wise a teaching is, the more counterintuitive it is. The more a fool will look at it and say, oh, that's not wisdom, that's idiocy. And that's precisely how you know that it's wise. Because to a fool, it looks like foolishness. But to a wise person, it looks like deep wisdom. Psychology, I want you to notice, is especially counterintuitive. If you studied various research that has been done in, in psychology, and various psychological studies that have been done over the last hundred years, let's say, um, within universities and academia, you know, they, they keep coming up with all sorts of psychological studies that produce counterintuitive results, where people behave in ways that you would think that they wouldn't behave, but they behave that way. And it's because psychology runs your whole life, it's so important to understand psychology, but then psychology is so counterintuitive. And then that's what gets you into trouble, is the psychology that you bring into every situation in life. The psychology of money, the psychology of relationships, the psychology of business, the psychology of marketing, the psychology of your career, the psychology of uh, all of your emotions. That's what we're really interested in when we're talking about creating the good life. And also, think about how reverse psychology works. You know, on a child, you use reverse psychology to get them to do something that they didn't want to do. And that's very counterintuitive, isn't it? Like, when you tell a child to brush his teeth, he doesn't want to do it. And sometimes he doesn't do it just to spite you. So you can use reverse psychology of, oh, don't need to brush your teeth. And then maybe he will. Of course, maybe he won't. But uh, that's reverse psychology. So that gets a little idea of what we're talking about. And also, think about being a great strategist. The greatest strategists, what were they? They were highly counterintuitive thinkers. And I, of course, encourage you to do a lot of strategic thinking. I have a whole episode, one of my most popular ones, called How to Be a Strategic Motherfucker, where I talk about how to do just, just that. But think of, for example, Sun Tzu's The Art of War. What does he talk about there? He talks about military strategy. And all of it is about being tricky and being counterintuitive and outthinking your opponent not just using brute force. So now let's get into the examples. This is where the, the meat of this topic lies. So first of all, in business, it would be intuitive to try to maximize your profits at all costs. And you think that, that would make you the richest and the most successful in business. But actually, 
The counterintuitive move in business is not to pursue maximum profits. Because by pursuing maximum profits, what happens is that you end up um, leading your company into bankruptcy or into decay. That's what happens with businesses who purely pursue maximum profits. It actually hurts the brand in the end by trying to cut corners everywhere. It's counterintuitive not to cut corners. The obvious thing to do is to cut corners and to pay your employees the lowest possible wages. But then we know what happens with these companies in the long run. Sure, in the short run, they might make some money. But in the long run, they always get outcompeted by the companies who uh, build a stronger brand, who aren't just doing it purely for profit. Also, another example from business is uh, trying to appeal to everybody with your marketing. If you try to come up with a product the way that most naive business people do when they first start, is they try to create a product that appeals to everybody. Everybody in the world is going to love my product. And I don't want to possibly alienate everybody. So I'm going to add all these features into my product such that it appeals universally to all. And then when you do that, usually what happens is that nobody really loves your product because your product gets so diluted by trying to appeal to everybody. So when you're marketing, a really good idea is to have a very specific market that you're trying to hit. Maybe like women who are in their 40s, who are mothers, who have children. That might be a very specific type of niche that you're marketing. And you could come up with a product specifically for those kinds of women, you know, whatever their issues and problems are, you can go do your research and find those. And then, Whatever that product is, you know, it'll resonate with that particular market really, really well. Whereas, of course, everybody else won't care about that product at all. But that's going to be enough for you because all you really care about is just hitting a resonance with that particular niche. And that's a lot of what smart business strategy is about. Uh, another example of this in business, uh, there's many of these examples in business, but another one is sales. Have you noticed if you try to do sales that if you're desperate to get a sale, you usually end up losing the sale, which is quite counterintuitive. And if you're new to sales, you might think, well, man, why aren't people buying from me? It must be because I'm not pushing my product hard enough. So you go out there and you push it even more and even more. And then what you realize is that, wait a minute, it's the opposite of how I thought it works. The more desperate I am to make the sale, the more people don't want to buy from me. Why is that? Well, it's because when I'm desperate to sell something, what that sub communicates is that I think that my product doesn't have that much value, which is why I'm pushing it so hard. Because if I really believed that my product had a lot of value, I wouldn't need to sell it so desperately. I would just let people come to me. And that's counterintuitive. Another domain where there's a lot of counterintuitive examples is with attraction, especially if you're a man trying to attract a female. Man, how many hours have I spent thinking about this topic and, and struggling my way through this topic with female attraction? It's so, so counterintuitive. When you start off as a guy and you're not successful with girls and you're trying to attract some girls, you're trying to date, uh, what you first try is the nice guy approach. You try to be extra nice because you think, well, what does a girl want? She wants a guy who's going to treat her well. And so you do that. But as you do that, you repel all the girls and none of them want to be with you. And this is so frustrating and so backwards because what we then see is we see the assholes and the jerks getting all the hottest girls. And you wonder, how could that possibly be? How can these women be attracted to like the, the scummiest guys? And then what you realize is that actually it's because in trying to be so nice and trying to supplicate to women, what that sub communicates is that communicates that actually you're a low value guy. Because if you were a high value guy, you wouldn't place so much value on the girl. You wouldn't place so much value on her looks and you wouldn't, you wouldn't bend over backwards to try to attract her. And women are very, very sensitive to that. So as soon as they see a guy who's trying to bend over backwards to attract her, she's immediately going to get turned off. It's the same thing as trying to be very desperate to make a sale. You're subcommunicating low value. Uh, another very counterintuitive thing is that the less committed you are to a girl, the less you care about her, the more uh, she'll get attracted to you. 
Like it's, it's just, it's so uncanny the way it works. And I had to spend hundreds of hours like rewiring my entire brain so that I don't fall into these most obvious foolish traps in order to get better at attracting women. Another one with women is that bragging and boasting. You would think that bragging and boasting about your nice car and all of your money and the house that you own and how successful you are at work, that this would attract women. And it does the exact opposite. It makes you less attractive. So again, I had to spend hundreds of hours reprogramming my mind to stop me from boasting and bragging as an attraction strategy. In fact, what you discover when trying to attract women is that the opposite thing works. So if you're talking to a girl for the first time and you want to attract her, start talking about um, like how low quality of a guy you are, kind of tongue in cheek. You know, you can tell her that you work at Walmart and that you, uh, you live out of a cardboard box and that will actually attract her. Because what she sees there, of course, when you're doing this tongue in cheek, she sees that you're, you're, you're so confident in yourself that you don't need to brag about how nice your car is and all of this. You sort of trust that if she's going to get attracted to you, she'll get attracted just to your authentic personality. And then sure enough, she does because you don't come off as desperate and needy and try hard. Now, of course, don't get the wrong idea here that now you have to be an asshole to women in order to attract them. Um, you have to really distinguish between the attraction phase and the relationship phase. So you don't want to be an asshole uh, and treat your, your girl badly in the relationship phase. But during the attraction phase, which actually lasts for a very short period of time, the attraction phase is like only an hour long from the moment where you meet the girl to the moment where she makes a decision that she wants to sleep with you or that she even would. That moment where she gets sexually attracted to you, that particular moment, that's where you don't want to come off as overly nice. Um, and then after she's attracted to you, then you can be quite nice to her and she'll still love you. In fact, she wants you to be nice to her in the relationship. It's really just about the attraction component that we're talking about. In fact, I sort of came up with this super counterintuitive rule for myself where uh, if I'm talking to a really hot girl, my rule is that the hotter the girl and the more I want to attract her, the smaller that I tell her that my penis is. It's the funniest thing. It, it just cracks me up and it works so well. Um, it's amazing how effective this rule is. And you can test this for yourself by going to a strip club, if you're a guy, and um, finding some really attractive girls at the strip club, like supermodel level of attractiveness of girl, and then just try to get the stripper, just by talking to her, try to get her to naturally get attracted to you. And what you'll notice is that if you sit there bragging about how, how awesome you are and how big your muscles are and everything, she won't get attracted to you. But if, like, if I'm talking to a really hot stripper, what I'll do just, just to entertain myself is um, I'll start telling her like the worst things about me, starting with how small my penis is. And so the hotter she is, the, the smaller I tell her my penis is. And, um, and then also I'll start telling her like how crappy my job is and how bad my car is and all of this. And so, you know, you do all this, of course, kind of in a tongue in cheek way. It has to come off natural. And then just like you, you notice immediately how attracted she gets to you because she senses that you're not trying to um, do the ordinary, obvious thing that every guy tries to do with her. See, you're doing something counterintuitive. And it's just amazing. It, it blows your mind. And it's difficult as a guy, it's difficult to rewire your brain to work this way, right? You have to, you have to really be confident in yourself to be able to do that. Another example is investing. With investing, it's counterintuitive to buy when the market is crashing. Most people who invest are fools, and what they do is they buy stock when the market is at the high. Everyone's crazy about buying, so they just get into the wave. And then, of course, the market crashes soon after that. And then they get worried along with everybody else. As the market's crashing, they're all getting worried, and now they're selling off, selling off, selling off. And so this is the exact opposite strategy that you want if you want to earn money in the stock market. You got to be buying when the market is crashing and everyone's terrified. That's when you buy. And then when everyone's enthusiastic and the market is doing great and the economy is doing great, that's when you sell. And that's how you earn money. But you're probably going to lose a lot of money before you learn that lesson. Which is why investing is such a dangerous game to play. Another example is hedonism. This is a, a great example. 
just a crystal clear example of counterintuitiveness in life. By seeking physical pleasure in life, you would think that that would lead to the best life possible, but actually that leads to the worst life possible. It leads to enormous pain. Just ask a heroin addict, for example. Uh, and it's very counterintuitive to the point where, I mean, you spend a good chunk of your life, you spend decades in your life chasing physical pleasure, whether it's sexual or food and fine cuisine or luxury and travel or um, shopping and all this sort of stuff. You, you spend your whole life basically chasing this. Um, and it still doesn't click for, for most people that it's just creating more suffering and more pain. It doesn't work. The whole strategy is backwards. And then that's where you open yourself up to spirituality, which is the opposite of that. Which is why so few people understand spirituality, because spirituality as a whole is very counterintuitive. And we'll get to specific examples of that as we go along here. Um, but let's talk about perfectionism first. That's another great example. By seeking to be a perfectionist in your work, have you noticed that your work suffers? You would think that I would get the best work if I was this anal perfectionist, right? No, wrong. It backfires. How about with being a good parent? It's very counterintuitive not to lecture and criticize your child. The most obvious thing that parents do is when they see the child doing something wrong, they start to criticize the child, judge the child, tell the child no, and then they lecture to the child as though the child will understand your lecture. And of course, the child usually wants to do the exact opposite of what you lecture them, just to spite you. What the parent needs to realize is that the child actually needs to learn from making mistakes and that what you want to encourage in your child is um, a sense of exploration. You want your child to explore life and to learn the lesson that failure is not bad, but actually good. Through failure is how you make all your biggest lessons in life. But if you are the kind of parent who chastises your child all the time, uh, by the time your child goes off on their own, um, they're going to have this ingrained programming from you that failure is terrible and awful and that they're going to be judged harshly for it. And then, of course, they're too scared to actually live life because they're so afraid. How about with being cheap? I love this example. Do you know people who are so cheap that by trying to save pennies, in the end, they end up losing dollars? I know some people like this. Some people like this in my family, even. Um, a really good example for, is, is when you're buying uh, products. Like, a really cheap person will not want to spend 10 or 20 extra dollars to buy a higher brand quality brand, like Blender, for example, because they just want the cheapest thing. So instead of buying the $100 blender, they're going to buy the, the cheapest $50 blender. But then that cheap $50 blender, blender ends up breaking the next year, whereas the $100 blender will last you for a good 10 years. And so in the long run, by buying the cheapest, lowest brand products, you end up um, actually losing money. And I have a really good example of this. A few years ago, I went to a 99 cents store in my uh, neighborhood. And I've never been to a 99 cent store ever in my life until that point, because just I avoid cheap stuff for this reason. But I said, you know what, let's just go and see what they got there. So I was walking through it and just kind of like looking around. And at that time, I needed some post-it notes. I was out of post-it notes. And usually I buy the brand post-it notes, which are pretty expensive. It's like $10 for, for a pack of those. And here I see some um, generic non-brand post-it notes for 99 cents. And I'm like, okay, that's that's good. It's a pretty good deal. So I grab a pack of those. I bring it home thinking that I got a good deal. And then I start taking off the first post-it note. And I realize that as I'm taking off the note, the note actually has such terribly low quality adhesive that it, it doesn't even come off. The notes don't even separate properly. They actually tear and leave like various kinds of sticker marks on each other. And it was so terrible, like you, you can't literally, you couldn't pull them apart the way you can with a regular post-it note. It was so terrible, I had to throw the whole package into the trash after five minutes of trying to separate them. It was so frustrating. And that's that's when this uh, this idea of getting cheap was really uh, 
shown to me. Another example of this is, is with cheap food. People think that, oh, Leo, I don't have t- um, the money to invest in organic food and high quality meat and all this. You know, I, I'm just going to like eat ramen noodles. That's the cheapest way to go. Right. But then what happens 30 years later, 40 years later, when you've got heart disease and cancer and all this other crap that comes with eating this low quality pesticide filled food, food filled with lead and mercury and all of this, what are your medical expenses going to be? Is it still going to be cheaper then after you pay $50,000 for some sort of surgery? See, but people don't factor that in because they're too cheap. When you actually factor it in, and for example, you factor in the cost of eating um, low quality fruits and vegetables, which are filled with pesticides, which all get sucked in and lodged into your brain tissue, and then your brain tissue is filled with lead and mercury. And if you read the studies on lead and mercury, you know how that decreases your cognitive performance. Might give you all sorts of conditions like chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and all this sorts of stuff and headaches. And it just makes you less um, energetic and uh, it makes you less creative. Think about the cost of that long term, for example, in your career. If you're a creative type of person, if you're an artist, if you're a business person, you rely on your creativity to make a living. Imagine the cost of of that over the next 30 years of reduced creativity. Let's say your creativity is reduced by 10% because of all these heavy metals and pesticides in your brain. What's that going to cost you over 30 years? Another great example is education. It would seem obvious that people with the highest degrees and the most formal education would be the smartest ones, the most conscious ones. And that turns out to be very false. And actually counterintuitively, formal education, especially like getting master's degrees and PhDs, oftentimes this makes you dumber and less conscious because you get way too stuck in your logical mind. How about evil? Evil is a super counterintuitive topic. By trying to stop evil, you end up creating evil. If you ask the average person on the street, how do we rid the world of evil? What will they say? They say, well, let's just find all the evil people and kill them or put them in jail. That will stop all the evil. But that's precisely what will create the world's evil is trying to do that. The counterintuitive move is to love evil. Not in the sense that you actually love the killing of children, for example, or the the starting of genocides, but that you have such a deep understanding of life and how counterintuitive it all is that you see that hating evil just adds more evil on top of the evil. Hating evil ends up backfiring. If you want a real solution to evil, you love the evil to death. And also, it's very counterintuitive to love one's own sins to death. Usually, people who are very worried about sins, they don't want to be sinners. And so when they find sins within themselves, they think that the best thing to do is to to call themselves a sinner and then to start to hate themselves. Think of themselves as an evil one and try to get rid of the evil by hating their own evil. But of course, all this does is just adds gasoline to the fire. And it, it multiplies your sins because then what your psyche does is it has to suppress and deny all of that and then projects it out into the external world, which of course creates more evil. The counterintuitive move is to love your sins to death. Melt your sins away with love. Now, just look, take this one last example that I was talking about, this, this example of evil. Just think about how significant this example is. Think about how life transforming this is. If every human being on the planet grasped that by trying to stop evil, they are actually creating evil. And by trying to hate their own sins, they're actually increasing their own sinfulness. If they grasp that, think of how much suffering would be saved in the world. Think of how many lives would be saved. We're talking about millions of lives being saved just from this one counterintuitive example. 
So even though we're going down this list relatively quickly here, and we're covering all these examples, don't fall into the trap of thinking that, oh, well, yeah, Leo, you're just giving me a list and it's kind of nice, but what am I supposed to do with it? It's like, no, 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 no. Do you understand how powerful each one of these examples is? These are life transforming examples, but you have to really grasp the counterintuitiveness of this. You have to really grasp how you're doing it wrong. And then you got to work on embodying it. It could take you 10 years to learn how to just embody this one counterintuitive example with evil. Another example is with avoiding work. A lot of lazy people, they try to look for shortcuts and they try to avoid hard work. But counterintuitively, when you do that, you end up doing twice as much work in the end. Another example is with control and manipulation. It's counterintuitive to give up your manipulating and trying to control people. That's one of the biggest mistakes that people make with other people is that they try to control them. And this creates all sorts of problems. And then when you let go of control, counterintuitively, you see your relationships end up going much smoother. And for parents, you know, this is a very big insight. Stop trying to control your children so much. That's so counterintuitive. Because as a parent, you know, you want the best for your children. So of course you think that, well, if I want the best then, and I know so much, I know so much more than they do, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to control them to become the best that they can possibly be. And when you do that, ironically, you end up making them weak and reliant on you. And then they end up resenting you because you're not giving them the autonomy they need to, to struggle through life, make their own mistakes, and then flourish. How about the example of get-rich-quick schemes? This one's a really obvious one. People who chase get-rich-quick schemes end up never really building true wealth. And these get-rich-quick schemes, they're promising to make you a lot of money very quickly, but what you discover after you try a series of them is that each one basically fails and you waste five or 10 years of your life chasing all these schemes, plus you waste a bunch of your money buying all these different schemes. Of course, they're never free. Um, and then what do you have to show for it in the end? Nothing but failure and disappointment. And then you build up this idea that, well, I could never succeed in business. Yeah, because you're trying to do these get risk quick schemes, which never work. How about the example of the 80-20 rule, especially when it's applied in business? The 80-20 rule says that 80% of your results comes from 20% of your effort. What that means, for example, in business is that 80% of your profits come from only 20% of your products. It means that 80% of the work you do is only responsible for 20% of your profits. Whereas 20% of the work you do is responsible for 80% of your profits. So the counterintuitive move is to focus on the top 20% of your work and your profits and to cut everything else as much as you can. But most people, what they try to do is they try to be good at every percent of their business. And this ends up losing the money. How about rationalism? It's a good example. The rationalist, by being so fearful of illogicalities and superstitions, he thinks that he's going to live the most truthful kind of life by being a strict rationalist. And so he's going to avoid all sorts of new age and mystical thinking. But by trying to avoid magical thinking, the rationalist ends up cutting himself off from the magic of life. Because counterintuitively, life turns out to be magical. Rationalists just don't get this. How about the example of trying to be cool? Have you ever tried to act cool? What do you realize? You realize that by trying to act cool, you actually end up being such a tryhard that it's very obvious to people around you that you're not cool. What it means to be cool is to like not care. When you care about being cool, you're automatically not cool anymore. And that's very counterintuitive. How about with patience? A lot of people are impatient, and so they try to get stuff done quicker. 
faster. And they think that by doing stuff faster, they're going to end up getting double the result. But oftentimes, by trying to do it too fast, you end up um, having to redo things, and then it ends up actually taking longer than it should have if you just did it with patience. This is sort of a more general principle about the get-rich-quick schemes. How about people-pleasing? It's very counterintuitive that by trying to please people, they end up respecting you less, not more. A lot of people-pleasers don't understand this. See? Because if you really respected yourself, you wouldn't be going around trying to please people all the time. So if you're not respecting yourself, why would others respect you? How about with the example of negotiation? In a negotiation, if you want to be successful, you need to come into the negotiation not needing whatever is being negotiated. And that's really counterintuitive because usually the whole point of going into negotiations is because you need something. And it's like, Leo, but if I don't need this house or I don't need this car, then why am I even negotiating for it? Exactly. That's your negotiation. You need to negotiate from a position of strength, from a position of detachment. That's how you get leverage in a negotiation is that you need to sit down at the table and not need the car, not need the house, not need the loan. See? Uh, you know what they say, the irony with loans is that if you need a loan, you'll never get one. And uh, if you don't need a loan, then everyone will want to give you one. That's so counterintuitive. If you go desperately into, into a negotiation, you're going to get the worst possible deal. And the only way you really learn that lesson is by negotiating. Going into a few negotiations and getting totally hosed, and then it starts to click in your mind how counterintuitive negotiations are. How about with life purpose? A lot of people get hung up chasing money in life, in their career and in their business. And they think that, well, Leo, I can't follow my passion and my life purpose because I got to worry about paying the bills and I got to worry about money. But what I've actually discovered is that the most money I've ever made personally in my life is when I was following my passion, not when I was chasing money. Because when I'm chasing money, that demotivates me because I'm not passionate about money. I'm passionate about my passion. I'm passionate about doing my art. And so aligning yourself with your passion ends up being sort of a counterintuitive strategy that actually ends up earning you more money in the long run because it's, it's by being super passionate about something, even though it's not the most lucrative thing, in the end, that passion will win out because you'll be able to produce some amazing art or some amazing work that you just could not do if you were only in it for the money. How about with losing weight? A lot of people struggle to lose weight. Uh, and that's because it's so counterintuitive. Because most people, they think, well, I'll just, I'll just take one of these diets and try to lose weight as quickly as possible. They look for the diet that will lose as many pounds as possible on them. And then what they discover is that it doesn't work. It's these these yo-yo diets that just frustrate you by by helping you shed some weight, but then you get it, gain it back on because you're not really changing your eating habits and your relationship to food. You're just using some kind of gimmick and then you end up staying fat or even getting fatter or just getting frustrated and demotivated. And then, you know, after you've tried 10 or 20 of these diets over the years, then you stop even believing that it's possible to lose weight. That's just because you're doing it wrong. How about with pursuing goals? This is so counterintuitive. And this, this is a life-changing insight right here. Little goals are actually harder to accomplish than big goals. Why? Because a big goal comes with a big vision. It's inspiring and it's motivating. And it will actually motivate you to get up early in the morning and work on it because you'll be inspired. With a little goal, you would think, well, a little goal is easy because it involves less work. Yes, sort of logically thinking about it, that's what it looks like. But actually a little goal, if it's so little that it doesn't inspire you, then it won't make any difference in your life and therefore you won't be motivated to do it. That's why it can be easier to lose 50 pounds than it is to lose five pounds because five pounds makes no difference. You won't even notice it in the mirror, five, five pounds. 
you can't build a strong vision for losing five pounds. But building a vision for losing 50 pounds, that's very significant. Because, you know, 50 pounds will make a substantial difference in how attractive you look, how people react to you, and all of this stuff. And that will inspire you to actually do it. Motiva uh, meditation, rather, not motivation. Meditation is another great example of counterintuitiveness. Sometimes people say, oh, Leo, but I don't have time to, mo to meditate because I'm so busy, I'm working all the time. And you know, the classic advice that they give you about that is they say, well, the less time you have to, motiv to, to meditate, the more you need it. So if you don't have the time to meditate for 20 minutes, then you got to meditate for 60 minutes. And that's very counterintuitive. It's very counterintuitive to spend an hour a day meditating for most ordinary people. Because they th look at that and they, they think that it's a waste of time. You're like, Leo, what's the point of meditating? You mean I'm just going to sit there for an hour and do nothing and think about nothing? Why? Wouldn't it be better if I just sat there and thought about stuff for an hour? I would be more creative. But the answer is no, you won't be more creative. If you want to be smarter and more creative, try not thinking. Not thinking makes me the most creative person. When I do one of my solo 10-day meditation retreats out in the woods somewhere, all by myself doing nothing for 10 days, I have the most creative ideas. I'm so creative, I, it's hard to even continue to meditate. That's how creative I get. But see, most people, they don't understand this because it's so counterintuitive. It's also very counterintuitive that doing nothing is hard. Most people think that doing doing stuff is hard. And that doing nothing, that, that's easy. Any fool can do nothing. Oh yeah? Try it. Have you tried to do nothing for 10 days straight? If you haven't, this is one of the most powerful techniques for personal growth ever. Ever. Sit for 10 days and do absolutely nothing. And by the end of those 10, 10 days, you will have like leveled up your life by, by 20%. It's amazing. And it's also very, very difficult. You'll notice that doing nothing for 10 days straight is the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. And if you're not devoting at least 10 days a year for doing nothing, you're really missing out on how much you could be growing. In fact, really, you should, you should probably schedule at least two retreats per year where you just sit and do nothing for 10 days straight. Two of those if you really want to be growing. But see, that's so counterintuitive. Most people, they won't be able to, to come up with the right justifications in their minds to actually be able to schedule that. Because they'll say, oh yeah, Leah, that sounds nice, but you know, I got family obligations, I got work, business, money, this, that, I got all this stuff. I don't have time to, to schedule 10 days of doing nothing. Right, because you're doing the emotionally easy thing. You're doing the most obvious thing. You're doing the most logical thing, which is why you get mediocre results in your life. It'll take you many years before it clicks that, oh, I really got to schedule these retreats. They're the most important thing in my life. The most important chunks of time on my calendar during the year are my two do-nothing 10-day retreats. See? But it takes a lot of failure before you learn that. That's a counterintuitive move. Creativity is very counterintuitive. Have you noticed this? That it's counterintuitive that you're the most creative when you aren't actually trying to be. Like when you sit down at your desk and you want to write a book or you want to do something like that and be creative on command, you have you noticed that you're not very creative? But when you're not trying to be creative, when you're just like in the shower or on the toilet, or cooking food, or just driving your car, you're the most creative. On the weekends, I'm the most creative. It's so counterintuitive. I, I always have my best insights when I'm not trying to have my best insights. Usually on the weekends, usually when I'm driving in the car to the grocery store, something like that, which is why I keep a little uh, post-it notes in the car so I can write down my, my best insights. But that took me a long time to learn because it's so counterintuitive. It's also counterintuitive to be a man. Most guys, most juvenile guys, they think that to be a good man, they need to act macho. 
and it doesn't click for them yet that by acting macho, they're actually coming off as an insecure beta. A truly strong man doesn't need to act macho. And in fact, embracing your feminine side makes you stronger as a man. And that's very counterintuitive. And it's counterintuitive for people who are stuck in stage orange, spiral dynamic stage orange, um, and that stage is, is rather masculine, for them to move up into stage green because the stage green is more feminine. And then guys get worried about it. They say, oh, well, am I going to become some, some weak feminine soy boy? I don't want to become that. I want to be more macho. And so they resist going into green. But what they don't realize is that by integrating their feminine side, they're actually going to become much stronger as a man. Another example is with rest and relaxation. It's counterintuitive that rest actually improves the quality of your work. It makes you more creative. Another example is tithing money. You know, certain religious traditions, especially I think Christian ones, um, there's a principle there, a long time-honored principle of giving away 10% of your money every year to charity or something like that. Um, and, you know, many people who are struggling with money, they would say, well, yeah, Leo, if, if I had a million dollars, if I was earning a million dollars a year, yeah, I would give away 10%, no problem. But, you know, Leo, I'm just earning 30,000. When I'm earning 30,000, giving away 10%, you know, that's going to that's gonna make it hard for me to earn more money and to make my, uh, my ends meet. But, but what you don't realize is that when you're, when you're trying to hoard your money and you're so stingy with it that you don't give it away to charity, what happens is that um, that's actually subcommunicating to your own mind that money is scarce. And so you're actually operating from this scarcity mindset. Whereas when you're giving away 10% of your income every year, um, what that communicates to you is that money is abundant and that I'll just get more. and It's not a big deal. But, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's counterintuitive to actually do it. Try to actually, want, for one year, try to actually give away 10% of your income. That's so hard to do unless you've, you've trained yourself to do that. It's so counterintuitive, especially if you come from a sort of a, a, um, a, a history like I did, for example, where money was scarce in the family and... Um, and so I had to kind of like learn to be frugal and learn to be conservative and not to waste my money. You know, it's very difficult for me to convince myself to give away 10% of my income. Like super, super difficult. Very counterintuitive. But then I also noticed that uh, because I don't give away that much money, uh, then I noticed that I find myself in this scarcity mindset even when I do have a lot of money. It's so, money is, is such a counterintuitive topic. I have a whole episode called Money Psychology where I talk about many of, the counterintuitive facets related to money. And that's directly proportional to why people stay in poverty and never really are able to amount great wealth because their psychology is backwards. How about the example of creating a good portfolio? To get my first job, I had to create a good portfolio. I, I was a video game designer. And so the intuitive thing for me to do was that I thought, well, let me get all the work I ever did and put it all into this portfolio. It's going to be the most comprehensive portfolio of my work. And then what I discovered is that um, it didn't work. It was terrible. It was a terrible portfolio. If you want a great portfolio, what you need to do is you need to pick the top 5% of your work and hide everything else. Your portfolio needs to be small, uh, but like really, really well polished and then your portfolio becomes impressive and then people will hire you how about the example of giving credit that's super counterintuitive the um the conventional way of thinking is that we don't like to give credit to other people because that we think that 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 takes credit like away from us and uh I've had to str struggle with this, for example, when I, when I shoot my videos, because a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm researching many sources. A lot of my information comes from hundreds of different sources. And sometimes I get insecure about like giving credit to a source that I got a piece of information from, because I think that, well, but if, if I, if I say that I got this information from such and such a source, people will think that I didn't create it myself. It wasn't an original insight that I had. Um, 
uh, but then so, so, I, so I noticed that in myself. I noticed that sort of like contraction of me wanting to kind of like own these insights. Uh, but then I also that 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 noticed that makes me sort of a weak person, and sort of counterintuitively, I need to be more generous and actually credit more. And then counterintuitively, what happens is that when you credit people properly and you credit excessively, what actually happens is that people who are watching and listening to you, they'll say, "Oh, look, this person is a really like honest and reliable person." And he's so confident in himself that he doesn't care about giving credit to others. And then actually that makes you um, look the best. It makes you look very credible when you give credit to other people. Counterintuitively. That's so counterintuitive and that's something I've always struggled with. And one of the challenges I face with actually is that is because I do pull from so many sources. A lot of times I don't credit all the sources that I pull from. Honestly, partially it's because of my own insecurity. But also other times it's because... Um, Oftentimes, I just don't even remember where I got some of these ideas because, like, I've studied so many sources. It's hard to keep track of where you get all of your ideas. And then they mix in with my own insights, and so it's just sort of this massive hodgepodge. Um, although in my own commonplace book, I do try to keep a list of my sources, um, uh, you know, just so that I can credit people properly, especially if I'm doing some kind of formal work, like if I'm writing a book, for example. For my book, I'm keeping a, a very detailed list of 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 credits and sources. Um, another example is with solving problems. Have you noticed when you're working on a really challenging problem at work, um, and you're just you're kind of going at it after hour after hour after hour, and it just it, it won't solve. And then counterintuitively, what you have to do is you have to leave the problem alone, leave it alone, go away for for a few days, come back, and then the problem is magically solved. That's so counterintuitive, but that happens precisely because you're more creative when you're not pushing yourself and forcing yourself to have to be creative. So over the weekend, while you're shopping for groceries, the solution will just come to you because that's how creativity works. The next example is love. Love is super counterintuitive. Most people think that love is me surrounding myself with lovely objects. Like I have a beautiful woman in my life or I have an awesome man in my life or I have beautiful, awesome children. I can love them and I have a beautiful dog and I love my dog and I have a beautiful house and I love my house. And so love is all about getting lovely stuff when actually it's the exact opposite of that. Love is not about giving and getting stuff. Love is about you being able to radiate love out into the world. That's what true love means. It's, it's about rewiring your mind such that you're always giving more and more and more of yourself to the world. And then you feel so good by doing that, that then you feel the love. You become the source of the love. And then you don't have a scarcity mindset with love. And then it's not easy to break your love because with a person, you know, with the average person, their love is very easy to break. All you have to do is take away that lovely object that they're attached to. Whereas a person who's always radiating love, you can't break their love because they're the source of it and they're always radiating it, which makes them the most loving. And then people want to love them back because they receive so much love from them. See? Whereas those people who are always wanting to leech love like a love vampire, they're the ones who end up alienating everybody because nobody wants a love vampire to be around them. Which leads us to the next example of relationships. Relationships are extremely counterintuitive because in a relationship, the intuitive thing is to focus on getting your own needs met. It's like, I'm in a relationship with you so that you can satisfy me sexually and you can do all the chores that I want you to do and uh, you can be there for me when I'm sad and you can, you can fill all the voids in my life. That's usually how people get into relationships and that's exactly the opposite of what you need to do if you want a great relationship. You want to instead satisfy your own needs so much that you don't care about your own needs anymore. And now you're focused on actually the needs of your partner. Now, of course, that really only works when your partner is willing to do the same. So a lot of mistake that people make is they get into this kind of relationship where they, they focus on fulfilling the needs of their partner, but their partner is like a a uh, malignant narcissist and just keeps sucking and sucking and sucking and sucking. So that's not going to work. 
uh, it, it takes two to tango in this in this relationship. And so your partner also needs to be on that same level as you. Otherwise, it's going to get toxic. Another example is with emotional armor or psychological armor. What this means is that psychologically, we armor ourselves against the world. Every time that we get wounded or hurt from the outside or we suffer, we create sort of a wall. A piece of armor gets created whether it's in a relationship or in business or something like that. You know, if someone screwed you over in a business deal, you're going to develop some armor. If someone cheated on you in a relationship, you're going to have armor. And you're doing, by doing this, you, you think you're going to make yourself invulnerable. But actually what ends up happening counterintuitively is that you, you cut yourself off from life and from the world and from feelings. And so the counterintuitive move in this situation is to actually surrender your armor and make yourself more vulnerable. The best life is a vulnerable life. And uh, very counterintuitively, uh, people don't understand this, for example, when they're trying to um, arm themselves with guns. People say, oh, there's, there's all these mass shooters running around and terrorists and all this chaos happening in the world, so I need to amount a bunch of guns. I need to build a gun arsenal. So the logic goes. But this is exactly backwards. Because actually, statistically speaking... If you own guns in your household, the thing that's most likely to kill your family is your own guns. Not some terrorist or some mass shooter somewhere. It's your own guns. That's so counterintuitive. And also by surrounding yourself with this arsenal of guns, what is that really subcommunicating to you and to, to the rest of the world? That you're scared. And that you're actually vulnerable. A vulnerable person, a scared person, needs a lot of guns. Whereas someone who's really courageous and has opened themselves up and kind of let go, he doesn't need to surround himself with guns. Now you might say, Leo, but what if someone comes and tries to rob you or shoot you? What are you going to do then? Well, that's right. That's what it means to really accept your vulnerability. Is you accept that you are vulnerable, which means that someone can shoot you. And you know what? The fact is that even if you have an arsenal of guns, someone can still shoot you. The arsenal of guns won't defend you nearly as much as you think you will. Uh, it will. You see? So vulnerability is very counterintuitive. And I notice that men suffer from this problem a lot because men try to act macho a lot. So men don't like to admit that they're vulnerable. And that's sort of what it means to start to embrace your feminine side more, is to embrace your vulnerability. Admit that you're vulnerable. Because the truth is that you are. We all are. Because you're alive. And so long as you're alive, you can die. And that, by definition, makes you vulnerable. Freedom is also very counterintuitive. Because a lot of people say, oh, well, we need free speech and just freedom to the hilt. Everything has to be free and freedom, 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 freedom. But then what they don't realize is that freedom, too much freedom actually backfires and actually creates chaos. So counterintuitively, by creating good government regulations, you would think, well, that's not freedom. That's infringing on my rights. If we lived in the Wild West, I could just own a gun, I could just like have sex with animals, and I could do anything, and there'd be no laws, and everything would be just the best, maximum freedom. But maximum freedom is just complete chaos. You don't really want freedom, because if you really lived in some kind of crazy Wild West, totally free society, that would just be a survival of the fittest, that's all that is. It's like jungle. It's like living in a prison. The strongest person is going to dominate all the weaker people in that kind of scenario. So actually, strategically creating regulations and rules maximizes freedom. See? So, in a certain sense, it might seem that regulating guns, for example, limits freedom. But in a certain sense, it doesn't. It actually increases freedom. Because now you have the freedom to like walk through the park or send your children to school without worrying that they're going to get shot. See? Freedom is extremely counterintuitive. And a lot of these stage orange people who are diehard advocates for freedom, they don't understand this. If you lived in an environment that was totally free, you would be dead. See? The only reason you can even stay alive as an organism is because 
there are very tight restrictions on your environment. You need a very stable environment, which means a limited environment in order to be able to live at all. How about the example of overthinking? A lot of people think that by thinking a lot, they will make great decisions. But actually, counterintuitively, the opposite thing happens. When you overthink a decision, you end up making the wrong decision. Changing complex systems is very counterintuitive. For example, changing the environment or changing public policy with government. Or for example, like take the Iraq war. A lot of people thought that the Iraq war was justified because it helped to prevent terrorism from spreading. That was basically the justification for the Iraq war. But now in retrospect, we see that it's the exact opposite. The Iraq war actually helped to spread more terrorism. And a lot of government action works exactly this way. Because government is a very complex system and complex systems tend to be very counterintuitive. Speaking of government, a lot of people get it in their head that it's possible to create a utopian government. If only we got rid of the military. If only we got rid of, of all the all the corporate corruption and all the other problems in government, we can create this, this pure utopia of hippie love and, and, and everyone would be enlightened and conscious and it would be wonderful. And then in practice though, these people end up creating the worst dystopian nightmares. Because they underestimate how counterintuitive all these systems are. War and peace is also counterintuitive. A lot of stage green hippies think that, well, if we could just get rid of all the militaries in the world and all the guns, then we would have peace. But that's not how it works. If you want peace, counterintuitively, you actually need a very strong military. That ensures peace. Stage green people don't fathom this. They think too simplistically about war and peace. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that you need to go start wars. I'm not saying that. You could have a strong military and use it only defensively for peacekeeping purposes, or you can have a strong military and use it very flippantly the way the United States does lately. Um, and then, of course, that doesn't ensure peace. So there's there's right and right right and wrong ways to go about it. How about self-love? Also very counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive to love yourself more when you fail. Usually what people do when they fail is they start to hate themselves. They get really harsh with themselves. They start to blame and criticize themselves. But that just doubles down on the failure. Next time when you fail, try to love yourself the way your mother might love you if you had a loving mother, despite any of your failures. And then see what happens. See how quickly you outgrow your failures. See how much stronger you and resourceful you become. How about ideals? Ideals are very counterintuitive. People think that having high ideals and principles is really good. But actually, counterintuitively, by having a lot of high ideals, you're never going to live up to your ideals, so you're always going to be miserable and suffering because you've created this fantasy of these high ideals that nobody can possibly live up to because reality is over here, but your idealistic fantasy is up there. And people think that by having this idealistic fantasy that they're gonna, they're gonna create that, but in reality, reality is different. You're not gonna create that. You're just gonna torture yourself. How about the example of anger? And now we're really getting to some very juicy and practical territory. These next few examples I'm gonna give you are all gonna be emotional, psychological examples. And emotions are some of the most counterintuitive things that there are. And also, emotions are one of the most important factors in the quality of your life. So anger is very counterintuitive. Most people think that by being angry, all they're doing is they're just authentically expressing their, their emotions. But actually, when you're being angry, you're in denial of the fact that you've been hurt. 
So anger is not an authentic authentic expression. Uh, anger is a is a smokescreen for actually admitting to yourself that you've been hurt. And that's super counterintuitive. How many years is it going to take you to learn that and stop being angry? That'll take a lot of years if you're anger prone. How about with suffering? Suffering is one of the most counterintuitive things. When we suffer, the obvious thing that we do is we recoil and we try to kind of shut ourselves off from the suffering. Create that little piece of armor there. And to distract ourselves from the suffering. One of the most counterintuitive things you can do in life is to actually open yourself to the suffering and fully feel it with full mindfulness and consciousness and really suffer it. Like, really suffer it. Extra hard. And from that, actually, you will be able to dissolve your suffering. It's in the resisting of suffering that most suffering gets created. That's so counterintuitive and so challenging to embody. You can know this logically, but then to be able to embody it in everyday life when you're actually in a moment of deep suffering, that's really difficult. That takes a lot of training. And that's a lot of what spirituality is about. And that's also why spirituality is so counterintuitive. One of the ways is because, you know, uh, this is a classic technique that spiritual masters and gurus and yogis have used for thousands of years, is that they deliberately make themselves suffer by lying on a bed of nails, for example, or sitting and meditating on a hard rock in a cave somewhere. This creates a lot of suffering. But this is exactly what spiritually purifies them and ultimately makes them a happy person is because they went through all that suffering. See, and that's so counterintuitive. Most people, what they want is they want to do the opposite. They want to surround themselves with a cushy environment where everything is perfect and idealistic and or idyllic rather. And, um, and, and in that situation, actually, you become soft and you become weak. And then even the littlest agitation will make you suffer enormously. Whereas the person who lives in a cave for 10 years, to him, he can endure in enormous suffering and uh, no problem. Because he's trained himself on it. And that's the whole idea behind asceticism. Fear is also a great example of counterintuitiveness. A lot of people, when they're faced with a challenging situation, they'll worry about that situation. And they'll think about it and they'll ruminate about all the stuff that can go wrong with it. And uh, the idea being that if you worry so much about it, that somehow you're going to prevent it. But actually what ends up happening is the exact opposite. By law of attraction, you end up attracting those things which you think about. So if you're worrying and you're thinking about negative stuff, you tend to attract that. So if you're fearful about lack of money, that tends to actually instill and program you with a, with a poverty mindset. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're fearful about love and you think you're going to end up alone and that makes you needy and clingy, when you do get into that relationship with your perfect partner, you're going to be so needy and clingy and so fearful of, of losing their love that actually you're going to repel them away and they will leave you for your neediness. And then that creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's why fear is so dangerous and so toxic. What's really counterintuitive with fear is to face it head on. Our natural inclination with fear is to try to resist it or distract ourselves from it. Is to avoid the thing that we fear the most. And uh, what spirituality teaches us is that we have to go into the fear and face our greatest fears head on. And then through that, we conquer our fears. We realize that our fears, all fear, is just illusion. But that's so counterintuitive because a fear does not appear like an illusion. It appears like reality. But then again, that's precisely what an illusion is. An illusion is an appearance which mimics reality, but really isn't. How about the example of arrogance? It's counterintuitive to be humble. Have you noticed this? Or blame. It's counterintuitive not to blame other people when something goes wrong. How about criticism? It's counterintuitive to listen to criticism. Our natural inclination when we get criticized is to, again, create armor and shut ourselves off 
and to instead demonize the person who is criticizing us to invalidate their criticism because their criticism is pointing out some weakness in us that we need to work on and fix. But of course, we don't want to admit that we have a weakness. The ego doesn't want to admit that. The counterintuitive thing is to actually listen to feedback. And that's counterintuitive because it's emotionally difficult to do that. Because then you have to open yourself up to the possibility that other people might know more than you. Minimalism is another example. It's counterintuitive that less is more. Minimalist design, for example, is actually harder than non-minimalist design. Because it's actually very difficult to edit away all the fluff and trim all the fat off of your product or creation to get it to that perfect, polished, minimalist look or function. Usually what people do intuitively is they, they just try to lump a bunch of features into a product. Like if they're making a piece of software, they're not going to create a, a simple, minimalist piece of software that does exactly what it needs to do. They're going to lump all these features into it. It's going to make it all bloated and, and, and make a terrible piece of software. And also, minimalism in your life is, is counterintuitive as well. You would think that I would have the best life if I surround myself with a bunch of cars and houses and yachts and, and objects and, and a bunch of clutter in my house. But counterintuitively, that actually makes your life worse. Because now you have to worry about all these things. All these things can break. They all need to be maintained. There's costs involved with them. You always have to be... Um, thinking about them. Whereas if you simplify your life down to just a few simple things, just the bare necessities, you actually end up having more time to do the stuff that really matters, like meditate and do spiritual work and follow your passion and go traveling and having cool experiences rather than uh, <laughs> working through that mess of clutter that you have in your garage. Open-mindedness is very counterintuitive. When I tell people to be open-minded, radically open-minded, uh, the commonest objection I get is that, Leo, but if I'm open-minded, that means I'm going to believe crazy, stupid ideas like flat earth. But a flat earther is not open-minded. They're actually closed-minded. By being open-minded, you're not going to believe in flat earth. You're just going to open yourself up to exploring reality. It's very counterintuitive that by opening your mind, actually, you reduce your likelihood of false beliefs because with an open mind you don't cling to any beliefs you're not attached to any of them it's the closed-minded person who is and so actually it's the closed-minded people who end up coming up with all the conspiracy theories it's the closed-minded people who are actually the flat earthers and who believe in all the kooky fringe ideas that are out there which are uh ridiculous those are the closed-minded people not the open-minded people Selfishness is also very counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive to live a selfless life. Because you would think that, well, the best life that I could live is one where I'm always concerned about myself and my needs. And where I'm always getting more and more and more and I'm manipulating as much as possible to get everything that I want. That's the best life, right? Wrong. Exactly the opposite. It's when you surrender that entire dynamic and you live your life to give to others, to love others, to help others, to serve the world, that's when you're going to have the best life, the selfless life. Projection is a very counterintuitive psychological mechanism. Projection is when we deny something within ourselves and suppress it, and then we see it everywhere out in the world. So, for example, if... If I have homosexual tendencies as a man and I'm afraid and I don't like them and I think it's somehow wicked or sinful, I'm going to suppress that within myself and then I'm going to, I'm going to be angry at all those homosexuals that, that I see out there in the world. And that's super counterintuitive because your mind doesn't know that it's doing this suppression. All that the mind knows is the mind just knows there's all these evil homosexuals out there who are corrupting our children and our society. It's very counterintuitive to, to, to be able to, to change your perspective and to see that, oh, could it be that that stuff that I'm demonizing out there 
is to actually stuff that I myself am inclined to do? Could it be that, that this is why I'm getting triggered by it? Could it be that that's why I'm so angry at those people out there? And sure enough, that's how anger works. It's a projection. Denial, of course, is another very counterintuitive psychological mechanism because when you're in denial, you're, of course, in denial that you're in denial. So most people who are in denial, they kind of look inside and they say, well, look, but I'm not in denial, so I must not be in denial. But of course, if you were in denial, you would be so in denial that you would be in denial that you're in denial. Um, which brings us to example of self-deception. Self-deception works in the same way. Most people don't bother to introspect and look at their own self-deception. Most people, they see self-deception out there, which of, of course is just a projection. If you're triggered by all the self-deceptive and the deluded people out in the world, that's only because you yourself are self-deceived. But of course, the person looks inside and says, wait a minute, Leo, I'm looking inside and I'm, I'm perfectly rational. All my beliefs are scientific and valid. I'm not self-deceived. But of course, that is the self-deception. That's so counterintuitive. Skepticism is also counterintuitive. A lot of skeptics also do, do this sort of projection game where they are skeptical about all the other stuff out there, but they never turn their skepticism inwards. It's very counterintuitive to be skeptical first and foremost about your own beliefs and ideas and your own skepticism rather than directing your skepticism as a weapon out at the world. It's also very intuitive to think that everyone thinks like you. And it's very counterintuitive to realize that actually, no, there are people out there who have a different type of brain, who have a different type of personality, who literally experience reality differently than me and think totally differently than me. And that this is the result of a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication. Morality is also very counterintuitive. If you truly want to be moral, you got to make the counterintuitive move of giving up all morality. All of your moral rules, give them all away. Throw them away. And then you will truly be moral. But if you go around touting your own morality and telling people how moral you are and how immoral they are, that immediately tells me that you're actually not embodying your morality. Because a truly moral person would never do that. Because true morality is not based on rules. It's not a self-image that you adopt. It's not a list of 10 commandments that you follow. That's super counterintuitive, especially for stage blue people. Spiral Dynamic Stage Blue does not understand this. And this is actually why Spiral Dynamic Stage Blue ends up creating so much evil in the world. Because when you think you're so righteous and good and so moral, you will go and kill people in the name of your morality, which is precisely what creates evil. So twisted. Happiness is extremely counterintuitive. Because by seeking happiness, you are already unhappy. To be happy, you need to be happy with whatever is happening right now in the present moment. And that's totally counterintuitive because most people think that to be happy, I need to chase something or I need to create a circumstance in my life. I need to get into a particular happy state to be happy. And that's why they're never happy because they're always looking for happiness in the future when happiness can only be found in the present. Which means that you literally need to be happy when you're sad or you need to be happy when you're suffering. And that's very counterintuitive. Most people don't think it's possible to be happy when you're sad or when you're facing a problem or when something's going wrong in your life. But it is. You just have to retrain yourself. And that's very counterintuitive. God and the devil are very counterintuitive. Most people think that, well, you couldn't have two more opposite things. God is one thing. The devil is the opposite, right? Wrong. God is the devil. The devil is God. But again, good luck explaining that to a stage blue person on Spiral Dynamics. Death 
is also a very counterintuitive thing, possibly one of the most counterintuitive things I've ever experienced in my life, is the realization of what death is. You think death is the worst possible thing that could happen to you. It's the thing you fear the most. Death is the worst possible evil. And yet, when you actually experience it and realize what it is, you realize that death is nirvana. Death is love. Death is the greatest pleasure you will ever experience in your life. And that, that's so counterintuitive to people. It's counterintuitive even to, to realize that you can die and, uh, and still come back and talk about it. Enlightenment is extremely counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive that the self is unreal. It's counterintuitive that you were never born. It's counterintuitive that by surrendering all knowledge, you will actually end up having the deepest knowing of the universe. Through not knowing, you will end up knowing. That's super twisted. Our society treats not knowing as a negative. When actually not knowing is the deepest wisdom that you can um, have. Not knowing. That's what enlightenment is. People think that enlightenment is that I get to know everything. When actually it's kind of the opposite. Enlightenment is that you, you realize you know nothing. And through knowing nothing, there's an inversion uh, going a full circle. And then you realize that you also, in a sense, know everything. Paradox is another counterintuitive one. Paradox people have a negative opinion of, and they think that paradox is somehow illogical and somehow it's a mistake. What they don't realize is that paradox is a core feature of reality, and that's very counterintuitive. And that paradox is not a mistake. When you're doing logic and you encounter paradox, that's not a mistake. That's because logic is full of paradoxes. Because reality is uh, translogical. It's counterintuitive to sacrifice your queen in a chess game. And that's actually what makes the greatest chess games. I love looking at chess games. You can actually find YouTube videos of this. Maybe I'll post a good example of this where some brilliant chess grandmaster, the, the, the most brilliant ones, they can see so far ahead and they're so counterintuitive in their strategies that they will sacrifice their greatest pieces and end up winning the game. That's always amazing to watch. It's like a stroke of genius. And that's generally how you want to approach your whole life. Most people are so worried about losing their queen in life that um, they end up losing their king in the end. And you want to do the exact opposite. You want to surrender your greatest pieces um, and really focus on, on the stuff that needs to be protected. And through that, you will end up winning. It's counterintuitive to explore other points of view. It's counterintuitive to assume that all religions are true. Most people assume that all religions are false. And that's wrong. All religions are true. And that's very counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive to question materialism. It's counterintuitive to, uh, to have a long time horizon. It's counterintuitive to become a monk and to reject food, sex, alcohol, partying, and success and to go live in a cave. It's counterintuitive to consciously seek out pain for the purposes of spiritual purification. It's counterintuitive to put yourself in the challenging situations. It's counterintuitive not to multitask. Most people multitask. Focusing is very counterintuitive. Focusing on just one thing. It's counterintuitive not to let go of emotions. Most people hold on to emotions. It's counterintuitive to see failure as an opportunity. Most people get derailed by failure get demotivated, turn into victims. It's counterintuitive to be inclusive. Most people want to be exclusive. It's counterintuitive to embrace change. Most people want to resist change and deny change. It's counterintuitive to give your product away for free in business. Like I do with actualize.org. Like it's it's super counterintuitive the way that I do my videos because like I put I put some of my deepest stuff out there totally for free. The kind of stuff that most people would charge hundreds and thousands of dollars for in the self-help industry, I give it all away for free. And that's super counterintuitive. It's also very emotionally difficult to do that. It's scary to do that because then you got to worry about money. It's counterintuitive to question assumptions. 
it's counterintuitive that bombing terrorists doesn't solve terrorism. It's counterintuitive that prohibition of alcohol doesn't stop alcohol, but actually increases demand for alcohol or for other kinds of drugs, which is why the drug war is such a miserable failure. It's counterintuitive that micromanaging produces worse results, worse work, than if you actually trained your employees to work independently. It's counterintuitive to admit when you've been wrong or made a mistake. Most people want to deny it. It's counterintuitive to ask, wait a minute, how could I be deluding myself? It's counterintuitive to notice your own hypocrisy, your own self-biases, and your own double standards. Usually, we just notice the hypocrisy and self-biases and double standards of everyone else, but not ourselves. We see their selfishness, but not our own selfishness. We see their corruption and evil, but not our own corruption and evil. It's counterintuitive that hard manual labor pays less than white-collar work. I remember when I was young, when I was a teenager, like this, this really bothered me for some number of years, I remember. I just, I couldn't understand why the people who are like working out in the fields, picking strawberries in the heat for 12 hours a day, and like the construction workers who are building bridges in the dirt on the side of the highway in the, in the heat, why don't these people earn the most money? Why is it that the CEO earns the most money? That was so counterintuitive to me. Like, I just didn't understand that. Because I would, I, I kind of assumed that the harder the work was, the, mo the more despicable the work, then uh, the more they should pay you for it because nobody wants to do it. And actually, it's kind of the exact opposite of that. It's so weird. It's counterintuitive not to justify yourself. People love to justify themselves. It's counterintuitive not to try to change people. Oh man, in relationships, that's one of the number one mistakes is trying to change the other person. It's counterintuitive not to judge. It's counterintuitive that money, sex, fame, and success don't produce happiness. It'll take you several decades to learn that lesson, if not longer. It's counterintuitive that achieving your goals does not produce happiness. That's so counterintuitive because you think that the whole point of me pursuing my goals is to become happy. And then you realize, after you've done it for a long time, that it never works. No matter which goals you achieve, you're always still unhappy. Because again, happiness is never found in the future, it's always only found in the present. And you will never be happy until you deeply, deeply fathom that on a cellular level. It's counterintuitive to be playful and humorous during serious times. It's counterintuitive to select a good romantic partner. Most people select the entirely wrong romantic partners. Both men and women do this. Women will select the biggest asshole. Uh, who's the worst for her? And men will select the most attractive and beautiful woman that they can, who's also probably the worst for him. It's counterintuitive to stay positive in a negative situation. It's counterintuitive to love those who harm you. It's easy to love people who never did you wrong. Would you still love me if I harmed you? Of course not. You would hate me. Most of you would. The only reason you think you love me is because I'm doing everything to help you. And as soon as I stop helping you, uh, even for a second, you're going to start to hate me. That's how it works for most people. It's counterintuitive to forgive. It's counterintuitive to study many different religious traditions. It's counterintuitive that yogis and monks understand reality deeper than academics and PhDs. It's counterintuitive that you're not your body. It's counterintuitive that abstract metaphysical questions actually have enormous practical consequences. It's counterintuitive that truth is directly accessible. You would think it wouldn't be, but it is. No mind is also highly counterintuitive. The state of no mind. You would think that if you were in a deep state of no mind all the time, that this would make you the least effective person in the world. And you would be bad at your job, and you would be bad in your relationships, 
and you would be bad, bad with your planning and your decision making, actually the exact opposite. You are the most effective in a state of no mind. Which is why professional athletes, they train themselves when they're going through their routines or like a martial artist. When a martial artist is in the ring and they're fighting or a boxer is fighting, what do they do? They sort of psych themselves up in such a way that they enter a state of meditation and no mind. Their mind is silent so that they can just execute. They can be in total flow. No thinking going on. They are one with their actions rather than having to logically think through every little detail of their actions. And in fact, when you tell an athlete who is going through their routine to start to think about how they're doing their routine and you ask them, hey, can you tell me what you're doing? That actually kills their performance. That's so counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive that a chemical like 5-MeO-DMT can produce enlightenment. And yet it can. It always just um, makes me giggle when I see enlightened masters and yogis and teachers and various Buddhists and Christians and so forth, when they hear about 5-MeO-DMT and how it produces enlightenment, they all say, no, Leo, it's, it's fake enlightenment. It's not real enlightenment. Because it's so counterintuitive. You can't understand 5-MeO-DMT unless you've actually done it and experienced it for yourself. I know enlightened masters who will deny the power of 5-MeO-DMT and claim that it can't possibly produce enlightenment because enlightenment is not a chemical. Well, guess what? 5-MeO-DMT really isn't a chemical either. That all gets recontextualized once you're inside the trip. And the last thing is that it's counterintuitive that you are God. How's that for a fucking counterintuitive mindfuck? That you are God. Super counterintuitive. Especially for stage blue people who believe that they can't possibly be God because God is the thing that created me. Uh, but that's too deep to go into here and to explain. So anyways, that's the whole list. There's a lot of stuff there. Uh, I would encourage you to, to listen through this list again because I went through it rather quickly. Now, of course, you might say, well, Leo, this is a 90-minute long video. So that wasn't quick. It's still very quick for the amount of content that was packed into this list. I could spend 90 minutes talking about every single item on this list. And in fact, in some cases I have. Many of my episodes, what they do is they take one of these items from this list and then they just go into an hour or two of elaboration on it, talking about this counterintuitive point. And then when you learn about that at such a depth, then you say, aha, oh, now I understand what I've been doing wrong in my life, in this facet of my life, and why I've been not getting the results I want. It's often scary to do the counterintuitive thing. It's scary to go against the naive common sense that you have. It's scary to go against the herd. And it's scary to go against your own fear. Ignoring fear in itself produces fear. That's how sticky fear is. And it's scary to go against your sort of um, base biological instincts and programming. So it's not enough just to know about these counterintuitive moves. You also have to be able to execute the move. See? It's not enough, for example, to know that you should be facing your fear. You have to actually face your fear, which is a whole nother step. Now, most people don't even know that they have to face their fear in order to conquer their fear. Um, but even if you learn about it, that's still not enough. You got to go one step further. On all of these points, there's always a deeper step to go down. It's the one you're resisting. Hint, hint. So why is reality so counterintuitive? Well, it's a tricky question. The way that I explain it to myself is that reality is nonlinear. Which means that it tends to fold in on itself. It's got a lot of interconnected variables. And these variables end up sort of uh, folding in on themselves 
the output from one system ends up being the input to another system, and this creates all sorts of chaotic and twisted dynamics. Which is why naively changing a system, which is nonlinear, often produces the opposite result. Systems often backfire. Which is why good intentions are not enough. You must also understand how these systems actually work. Which is where systems thinking comes in. And if you want a, an understanding of what that means, go check out my episode, Intro to Systems Thinking, where I explain that in a lot of detail. And also, I have a whole subcategory on my book list with specifically books about systems thinking. Go check those out. Those are some very profound books that will move you up to stage yellow in Spiral Dynamics. So let's conclude by giving you my top five most counterintuitive moves in life. If you can manage to accomplish these, uh, you will live a remarkable, profound life that almost no human being ever lives, precisely because they never, it never occurs to them to do this. So number one is to pursue truth at all pursue truth at all costs, even at the cost of your survival and your self agenda. Very counterintuitive to do that. A lot of people tell themselves that they pursue truth, but they actually don't. They confuse the pursuit of truth with the pursuit of their self agenda, and these are two almost polar opposite things. You need to separate these out. And to be able to pursue truth, even when your self-agenda is threatened in that process. Number two is to live selflessly. Commit your entire life to living selflessly for others and for the world. And not just to satisfy your own little petty needs. Step number three is to love unconditionally. Don't limit your love to any one person or any one thing. Radiate love. Love the stuff that normally people would hate. Love that. Number four is to don't seek material pleasure. In other words, reject hedonism. Super counterintuitive. And number five is to die. Die while you're still alive. Face your own fear of death head on and experience what death really is. Which does not mean suicide. So no suicide. Don't physically harm yourself ever. Take good care of your body. But pursue death. Face it and find out what lies on the other side of death. That's possible to do. And if you do it, you will live an extraordinary life. So, in conclusion, always remember to be looking for that counterintuitive move. Even though I gave you a long list here, by no means is this comprehensive. In fact, what I want you to do is I want you to, in your notes, in your commonplace books, perhaps, if you're keeping one, which you should be, uh, start to make your own list. You can use my examples, but then create your own list of where you find the counterintuitive moves in life. If you're an artist... If you're a programmer, if you're a, a film director, if you're, uh, you know, an academic or a scientist or whoever you are, wherever you work, if you're a business person, start to make a list of counterintuitive moves in that domain and also in the other domains of life. And that will help you to really grasp this topic deeper. All right, that's it. I'm done here. That's the end please remember to click that like button for me and come check out actualize.org. That's my website. There you will find the book list, my life purpose course, my blog with various exclusive insights that you won't find anywhere else, and the forum. And the last thing that I'll say is that you have to be very careful with these teachings, with actualize.org teachings. Actualize.org is not to be confused with an ideology. Nothing I say is to be turned into an ideology. Nothing I say do I want you to believe on blind faith. That's a very nasty trap. I'm telling you these things because I want you to verify them for yourself. 
These things are things that I have verified for myself in my experience or that I'm in the process of verifying. You know, some of these things take a while to verify. You don't verify it in a day. Sometimes it could take you a year or five years or 10 years to verify something like enlightenment, for example, or one of these other points. Uh, you know, so you got to work at it, but then you got to verify it. So actualize.org is based on the principles of empiricism. You're testing stuff out, except rather than expecting other people to test it for you and to deliver the results to you, you're, you're doing the experiment internally on yourself. You're testing out your own emotions. You're testing out anger and sadness and fear and suffering. And you're actually checking, is, Le is what Leo is saying really true about fear and anger and suffering? And is it really true that if I take 10 days off and do nothing, that I'll be creative? Is that really true? You, you don't know until you do it. I mean, it, it all sounds nice when I say it. I can convince you of anything. I can come up here and spout all sorts of bullshit and convince you of it just because it's easy to convince the mind. All you have to do is spin a good story and the mind will get easily suckered into anything. So you have to test this stuff. Don't just believe me. And just because I'm saying this, don't, don't say, oh, well, yeah, because Leo is saying that this stuff could be verified, that means that Ah, oh, that that it's it's it must be true then. No, go verify it. What you might discover is that it's not true for you, because you have a different personality, you have a different brain type, you have, you see the world in a different way than me. You make different assumptions than me. You have different experiences than me. You live in a different part of the world than me, right? And maybe you also discover just mistakes. I make mistakes, and uh, more often than just making mistakes. Uh, I discover deeper and deeper truths. So stuff that I said five years ago, a lot of that stuff, it's true in a sense, but also like I've outgrown that. Now that teaching can still be helpful for you depending on what level you're at, but you know, I'm always outgrowing my own teachings because that's how it is. So you've got to really uh, verify this stuff for yourself. Don't just get seduced by my sweet words. Don't get seduced by my stories and my reasoning or any of that. None of that makes any difference at all. All stories, all reasoning, all logic, all evidence, all it's all bullshit. None of it makes any difference. The only thing that matters is what you can verify in your own direct experience. Is it true for you? Is enlightenment true for you? It doesn't matter whether I'm enlightened or not. That doesn't help you at all. Is it true for you? Do you know what the word is pointing to? Is it true for you that chasing food and sex and money and cars doesn't make you happy? Check. Check. You must check because that's the only way you'll learn. Like doing math. The only way you learn math is by doing math. You will never learn math just by listening to lectures about math. So really hold yourself to this. This is, I'm telling you, this is probably the number one key in order to get actualize.org information to actually be working in your life. You must be verifying it, testing it, embodying it all the time, and constantly being on the lookout like a hawk for your mind just taking this information on as a belief system. That's how religions get created. And if you're not careful, you will turn actualize.org into a religion. That's your doing, not my doing. I've told you from the very beginning that everything I say is nonsense. All of my words are just words. They're just beliefs and concepts and ideas. They're just maps. They're not the territory. I've told you that from the very, very beginning. But have you actually grasped that? And are you actually now doing the work that is required if you understand what that really means? Make sure that you are so that we don't get this religious ideology nonsense going. And uh, stick around for more. And the idea behind actualize.org is that I give you all this conceptual information, but then, yeah, you got to do all the hard work of embodying it and also verifying it. And through that, your life transforms.
And if you don't do that, nothing really changes. But um, mm, there will be a lot more concepts to come. Still tons and tons of topics that we haven't covered, not even remotely covered, that will change your whole life, but only if you act on them. So stick, for those, stick around for those and uh, make sure you act.